to see what the uh, what, what the courts decide on. I did. Uh, I will tell you, it's not going to stop us from doing our job. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. We have to govern, and we have to demonstrate that we can keep this thing together and keep the, the train on the on the tracks, and we are. Hello, I'm Nicole Killian in Washington, and welcome to America Decides. We begin with an exclusive interview with the chief of the U.S. Border Patrol, Jason Owens. It's his first sit-down interview in English as chief, and it comes as the future of Texas's controversial immigration law, also known as SB4, is in the hands of a federal appeals court. Yesterday, a three-judge panel heard arguments from Governor Greg Abbott and the Biden administration. If enacted, the law would allow Texas officials to jail and prosecute migrants suspected of entering the country illegally. Meantime, there continue to be calls for action on the federal level after a bipartisan border deal failed to gain traction in Congress earlier this year. Joining us now is our immigration reporter, Camilo Montoya Galvez, who sat down with the Border Patrol chief here in Washington. And Camilo, let's just start off with what he thinks is needed at the border. Sure, Nicole, nice to be with you. Border Patrol, Ch Border Patrol Chief Jason Owens is in charge of the federal agency on the front lines of this humanitarian crisis along the U.S.-Mexico border. Over the past three years, his agency has recorded unprecedented levels of migrant apprehensions along the U.S.-Mexico border, including over two million in fiscal year 2023. I asked him what he needs the most to deal with this crisis. This is what he told us. Do you need policy changes to address this crisis at the border? I think uh, we need to take a look at, uh, at the asylum laws and, uh, and, and make it where uh, only people that are, are, have a legitimate claim uh, can, can claim asylum. I think that we need to be able to, uh, to enforce the, uh, the immigration laws that are on the books and hold people accountable whenever they, they choose to break the laws. I think that... Uh, um, You're talking about tougher policies. Yes, it, simply to deter the uh, the desire to come across other than, at a point other than the port of entry. If there's no motivation to, to do it the right way and the right way is, is causing people to have to wait a little bit longer, well, naturally they're gonna choose to come between the ports of entry. We need to take that off the table and make sure everybody's coming through the front door, through the port of entry, and uh, that allows us to get back out to the, to the business of securing the border. And he also talked about the SB4 immigration law, which is the state measure in Texas that would allow local officials in Texas to arrest and prosecute migrants on criminal trespassing charges and also illegal entry charges. Right now, the Supreme Court initially allowed the law to take effect, but then an appeals court put it on hold again. We asked Chief Owens about this law, and he struck a slightly different tone than what the Biden administration has said about this measure. The administration has said that it will throw the immigration system into chaos, but let's listen to what he had to say. The state of Texas right now is asking federal courts to allow it to enforce a law known as SB4, I'm sure you're familiar with it, which would allow the state to arrest migrants on criminal charges and to order them to go back to Mexico. Would that law make the situation worse or better? So we'll have to see what the uh, what, what the courts decide on, right? It, uh, I will tell you, it's not going to stop us from doing our job. I'll tell you that, especially in Texas, there's no better partner for the Border Patrol than the Texas Department of Public Safety. We have worked hand in hand uh, with that agency for as long as I've been around, and I don't see that ever stopping. They have always been very good at complementing our mission. They back us up when we're out in the field, and, and we do for them as well. So whatever the laws are that they're going to be enforcing, our mission remains constant, their mission remains constant, and at the ground level, I don't see it ever changing where we're going to be there to work together to make sure that we keep the communities and our country safe. So unlike what the Department of Homeland Security said about SB4, Chief Owens is actually praising the state of Texas for the work that it has done to secure the border. And but did he explain that difference? No, he did not. He did not get into the nuance of that. But he did say that Texas officials are helping his agency, Border Patrol, deal with this unprecedented influx of people coming to the border. And I know you also talked to him about some of these tougher policies. What else did he share with you in your conversation? Well, Chief Owens actually named specific policies that 
he says need to be implemented to deter people from coming into the U.S. because he says right now people are getting the message that they can stay here indefinitely while their asylum claims are adjudicated, even though some of them may not have actual valid claims to stay here legally. This is what he said. What do you need the most to deter people from crossing the Rio Grande illegally or the desert in Arizona and California illegally? So everything revolves around being able to deliver a consequence for an action that you don't want a person to commit. So you don't speed because you're afraid of getting pulled over and getting a, a, a fine, a ticket. If people know that there's going to be a consequence for breaking the law, they're gonna be less likely to do it. The other piece of that is you need the agents out on patrol to be able to enforce that consequence. Those two things together at a basic level are what makes up our border security apparatus. The other things are force multipliers for those agents that help them stay safe and help them do their job better. I'm talking about technology. I'm talking about infrastructure to be able to respond along the border. I'm talking about the right equipment, the, the training that they need to, to be safe. All of those things come into play to make those agents out on patrol better at stopping that activity and being able to deliver the consequences when somebody does. And when you say consequences, you mean jail time. Jail I'm, time? I'm talking about jail time. I'm talking about being removed from the country and I'm talking about being banned from being able to come back because you chose to come in the illegal way instead of the established lawful pathways that we set for you. And are you pushing for that? For more people to be detained, for more people to be removed? Yes. If they choose to come in illegally, they have broken the laws and there has to be a consequence. Not because we don't want people to be able to come into the country, far from it, but because we want them to be able to come into the country safely. We want them to be out of the hands of the smugglers. We don't want money from that activity going into the pockets of the smugglers. And we certainly don't want the cartels to be able to exploit that situation that pulled our men and women off of the border security mission. It's important to underscore, Nicole, that in addition to calling for policy changes at the federal level, Chief Owens is calling for more resources and agents, and obviously only Congress can allocate the money needed for that. But as you know, Congress has been desperately gridlocked on this issue of immigration for decades. And right now there's this spending fight in Congress, as you very well know, over how much money the Department of Homeland Security, which includes Border Patrol, should get. So it is an open question as to whether or not he is going to get the money that he says he needs. Yeah, I was gonna say from that standpoint, I mean, does he feel like his hands are tied? Yes, in that respect, yes, but he's saying that at the end of the day, he cannot concentrate and focus on the bickering in Washington, which has been longstanding, as you know. He has to patrol the border and now take on this really dire humanitarian mission because for the most part, many of these migrants are seeking asylum. They're not trying to evade detection, unlike previous times in American history. That takes more time, takes more resources, and Congress so far has not approved any additional resources and money. All right, Camilo Montoya Galvez with that exclusive sit down. Thank you, Thank you so much. It is a device that millions of Americans use. Coming up, why the Justice Department is filing suit against Apple over its iPhone practices. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. The Department of Justice and more than a dozen states are suing Apple for allegedly breaking antitrust law. Attorney General Merrick Garland accused the tech giant of maintaining a monopoly over the smartphone market. Prosecutors allege one of the world's most valuable companies is stifling competition to maximize its profits. In a statement, Apple said the lawsuit is, quote, wrong on the facts and the law. Our Scott McFarlane is on Capitol Hill. And of course, Scott, before you got to the Hill, you were at the Justice Department when the Attorney General made this announcement. So why is DOJ filing suit now? And what does this mean for the average iPhone or Android user? Nicole, this is an indisputably bold thing because the Department of Justice is not only challenging one of the most prominent names in American business, but one with which Americans are so familiar and to a degree viscerally connected through their phones. What the Department of Justice argued today at their press conference is that Apple employs techniques, they argue illegal ones, to lock in their customers and lock out the opposition by making it untenable, if not impossible, for other companies to create apps or create devices that work in sync 
with iPhones and Apple products, that Apple blocks that, and the Department of Justice is arguing this is unlawful under federal law. Now, Apple has made an argument back to this, Nicole, saying what the Department of Justice is doing is inappropriate, but also stifles their ability to create new innovations, new products for you. What the Department of Justice is seeking over the next few years is some type of settlement or victory in court that requires Apple to change its policies and potentially make things cheaper or more available for customers. But Nicole, in the room, I tell you, the Attorney General really leaned forward and leaned into one point. He says when the United States of America takes somebody on in court, the United States of America tends to win. Very bold statement indeed. And, of course, there has also been, as you know, a push from both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill to regulate tech giants in recent years. How are they responding to this lawsuit? Hey, big, big tech has some big allies and big enemies on Capitol Hill. They have, since the advent of some of the technologies, you know, they do get some defense from some of those who have parochial interests, you know, employees who work for some of these companies. But they also have any number of critics who have urged the government to get more involved with setting rules and setting goalposts for these big tech companies. And you're seeing this now as they try to legislate over TikTok. But the attorney general is saying this is something quite different, not a political matter, but a legal matter. Take a listen to more of what Merrick Garland said during his news conference today. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. These things take years, though, Nicole. Federal antitrust suits can be measured in years, not months. Yeah, so it could be a while. But one thing that will be moving at a lightning pace is this effort to pass a funding package before a partial government shutdown Friday. So let's take a listen to House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, who addressed this a short time ago. Under no circumstances can we tolerate a government shutdown, which will hurt the American people. We have a responsibility to make sure that the government is funded, and the six appropriations bills do so in a way that takes care of the health, the safety, the education, and the economic well-being of the American people. So we saw this 1,000-page bill drop in the middle of the night. Now lawmakers have to vote on it before midnight Friday. Can they get it done in time? This is becoming a pattern, isn't it, where these things happen at the last second, but also this unique, this novel political composition is formed. You have a group of Republican leaders joined by an overwhelming number of Democrats, the minority party, in passing all these bills to keep the lights on, keep the government funded. We'll get the same opposition over the next 24 hours. We've seen the last few times this happened. The House Freedom Caucus, the conservatives, will have a press conference tomorrow decrying the size of the bill and the process under which it's passing. There are some number of progressives who have concerns about how Republican leadership is championing cuts to law enforcement in these bills, grants for local police departments, and the previous bill cuts to the FBI or to the ATF. But this will move through the same trajectory towards almost certain passage, but with this very unorthodox coalition behind it. Yeah, and of course, after government funding is cleared, we know Congress is likely to turn to a national security supplemental, which has already cleared the Senate. The question is what the House is going to do with it. I know you spoke with a group of bipartisan lawmakers who are trying to force a House vote specifically on the issue of Ukraine aid. How confident are they that this could work? Well, they're frustrated by how sluggish this is moving, Nicole, as you have seen as well as I have. Over the past few months, there's this coalition that wants money for Ukraine, wants it now. The White House included, saying money and munitions are running out. The money's needed immediately. But the process of getting this vote to the floor in the House has been sluggish to be charitable. There's a group of 15 House Republicans and House Democrats who have one of these end-run discharge petitions, a parliamentary technique to force a vote on the floor. They're making the argument, Nicole, that theirs is the only realistic path to getting this passed, not because a strange technique is needed because they think it's the only way to get something passed with 218 votes versus the supermajority of 290 that's been needed for everything else, government funding included. So they say theirs is the only ship that's going to sail. Take a listen to one of the 15, 
Congresswoman Jen Kiggins, a first-term Republican from Southeast Virginia. And it's a source of frustration for me as a new member of Congress, as a person who ran to restore American strength and to provide that stability to prove to our friends that they need to trust us and our enemies that they need to fear us. It's the only mechanism I have right now. You know, I'm hopeful that our leadership is going to listen and that we will be able to vote on this issue because it's important to not just me, but a lot of our Republican conference. House leaders have indicated they're going to move forward on Ukraine aid, but they're about to peace out of here for at least two weeks for spring break which means the sluggishness will persist. It also means we might peace out too for two weeks and pick it back up after the holiday where there will continue to be lots more to cover. Scott McFarland, thanks so much. New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez has made a major announcement regarding a potential re-election bid. What he had to say next year is streaming America Decides. Senator Bob Menendez says he won't file for the New Jersey Democratic primary in June. He has been indicted on federal bribery charges. Menendez says that he hopes his exoneration will happen this summer, and if so, he may run as an independent Democrat. Here's part of his announcement. This would allow me the time to not only remind New Jerseyans of how I've succeeded in being your champion, but how we will secure our financial futures, meet the challenges of raising a family, owning a home, provide for a college education, and secure a more peaceful world for all of us to live in. Senator Menendez faces charges related to bribery and corruption, including using his power to benefit Egypt and Qatar. He has pleaded not guilty. CBS News exit polling found 39 percent of voters in Ohio approve of President Biden's job as president. It also found that 58 percent of women 63 percent of voters under 30 and 61 percent of independents disapprove of the president. Now our political panel, Jasmine Wright and Daniela Diaz. Jasmine is a politics reporter covering the 2024 election at notice. And Daniela is a congressional reporter for Politico. Uh, welcome to both of you. I guess, Jasmine, I want to start off with you because I know you've spent a lot of time covering the president, yeah. uh, not just uh, in this cycle, but the last cycle as well. Uh, in addition, we have some CBS News polling that shows 73 percent of voters in Ohio say that the president shouldn't even be running. I mean, is this a sentiment that's just limited to Ohio, or is this a broader sentiment of voters around the country, and how should the campaign deal with this? Yeah, Nicole, I think it is uh, a broader uh, issue because if, you know, it's just another example, I think we see this larger trend uh, that voters just don't want to see a rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. They've said it in poll after poll after poll. But now, at the end of the day, that's what they're getting. That's what they're getting. <laughs> And I think if you ask the Biden campaign, they will tell you repeatedly, you know, voters aren't yet um, uh, really focused on it. They're not yet accepting that Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. But of course, we're getting closer and closer to November. So the question is, is when is that going to happen? Now, the Biden campaign will tell you that when that does happen, that Biden's numbers will go up. People will feel more comfortable with Biden. People will accept the reality that it will be these two men. But I think that what you're seeing in Ohio, those results are really just a part of a broader narrative that we continue to see across the country. And it's something that the Biden campaign is actively trying to react against and talk about how Biden is so much different than Trump in their view in a positive way. But again, it's going to take a long time, I think, as we've seen this messaging to really take an impact. And if you're talking to the Biden campaign, take a longer time for voters to really feel like it's going to be Trump and Biden again. And what about uh, with respect to voters of color? Because I know you've kind of done a deeper dive uh, with respect to that. And we have seen some shifts where some of that support appears to be softening, not only among African-American voters, in some case among Latino voters. You know, what is the Biden campaign trying to do to shore up the, that support? And we know that the Trump campaign as well is trying to go after that same demographic. Yeah, I think that there are real obvious warning signs. Now, if you talk to the Biden campaign, as I do a lot of the days here, I think that they would say that it's very early. But I think what we're seeing is not just a softening, but a real um, questioning of whether or not folks' lives were better four years ago or, or, or um, in the past than they are now. And we're talking about voters of color. Uh, they don't necessarily see, I've been focusing a lot on black women, prominent black women across the country, don't necessarily see themselves within the Biden campaign. And that's been a big problem because they say that it is reflective of the issues that we're seeing uh, that 
black voters may have with the Biden campaign. And it's also just opening the arena for Republicans uh, to be able to pick some of these voters away. Now, I think that it is not true or not necessarily real that a majority of black voters or even a large portion of black voters are going to vote for Trump in 2020, but the, I mean 2024, but the problem is that either A, they sit home, which would be a big deal, or that they get a larger share of uh, black voters or voters of color, Latino voters, than uh, Republicans have in a long time. And of course, that would be detrimental to Biden because those voters uh, are typically Democratic voters. And Danielle, I want to turn to you just on some of, uh, you know, what's been transpiring on Capitol Hill. Of course, we talked to our Scott McFarlane, and I'm sure you're very well aware that the clock is ticking uh, with respect to trying to avert this partial government shutdown. We just saw legislative text a couple of hours ago uh, earlier this morning. But you put out a piece uh, about Speaker Johnson having to work with Democrats, which will likely be the case uh, with respect to this government funding bill. I want to take a listen to what the speaker said this week on working together. What we're doing right now is unprecedented. There's never been a change of a speaker mid-course in, in the history of Congress. And we did it at the time where we have the smallest majority in U.S. history. We have to govern and we have to demonstrate that we can keep this thing together and keep the, the train on the, on the tracks. And we are. So he's really acknowledging there that he's got a very small majority and has to deal with that reality, which is much of what you reported on today. I mean, is this a sign of things to come in terms of other key legislation? Will we see him broker more deals with Democrats? Absolutely. You and I both cover Capitol Hill. We're there every day. We see that. I mean, small majority is an understatement. He has two votes he can lose on any piece of legislation if he wants to pass it along party lines, only Republican votes. So as a result, he's really leaning on Democrats to get these bills across the finish line. I spoke to dozens of House Democrats from different factions of the party for this story, to asking them if they feel like they're handing Mike Johnson wins because they're helping him get bills like government funding, like uh, uh, other types of really important pieces of legislation that Mike Johnson is then going and advocating and, and doing victory laps on. Republicans are doing that. And if they're going to regret doing that now, are they ever going to get fed up? They said no. They think that Americans are aware of what's happening on Capitol Hill, that Republican dysfun dysfunction speaks for itself. And they believe that they're the adults in the room. And that's why they're going to continue helping with these pieces of legislation. In fact, some of them even told me they think that there's going to be the majority of Democrats that even pass these appropriations bills that were negotiated by Republicans. Yeah, and one area where we're seeing a little bit of a divide is on this issue of Israel. Of course, the speaker just mentioned this mm -hmm. week that he may invite Prime Minister Netanyahu to address Congress. How do you think that might be received? You know, I was. this is exactly what I was tracking today. I was speaking to House Democrats, again, different factions, and asking them how they felt about, first, Schumer's comments last week calling for elections and saying that Netanyahu is not going to help with peace in the Middle East. And then also with Johnson saying, I want him to come and speak to uh, the con to Congress. Schumer said he's OK with that. House Democrats say that they don't want this to be a partisan issue. It's becoming a partisan issue because of the disagreement between how Speaker Mike Johnson is, is handling Israel. And also, he hasn't put Ukraine on the floor for a vote. And that's also something they wanted to pair together that hasn't happened yet. So there's a lot of anger toward the way Republicans are hang handling this issue. Now, when I asked if they'd skip, if Netanyahu were to come to Capitol Hill, a lot of them said, of course, we would probably be there. It's, an, it's still an important issue to us. All right, Daniela Diaz, Jasmine Wright, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you come back. And that does it for today. We will be back with another edition of America Decides Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You are streaming CBS News.